So our Green Group guest of the week this week is a guy that we've been trying to get on for a while. He's what you call a big get. He's the CEO of the United States Anti-Doping Agency, also known as USADA. Travis Tiger, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Really appreciate the invitation to be here. Absolutely. So we, we've been trying to get you on because you because USADA is going to be in charge of drug enforcement in our beloved sport, which sorely, sorely needs some drug enforcement. And obviously you're famous for, for busting Lance Armstrong as the head of USADA. And, you know, you're known as a no-nonsense guy, former lawyer. So I'm going to ask you just a basic question off the top, and then we'll get into a little bit of the details of, of what your role will be. How much do you know about horse racing? How much do you know to begin with? How much have you learned? What are you looking to learn? <laughs> it, it's usually the first question I get from horse folks. But, you know, listen, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, and pretty close to Ocala, Florida. Made, uh, well, I think I told the roundtable a few years ago, my high school basketball team had a chance to go to, to Lexington and go out and see some of the farms on that trip. So it was always something that was, you know, from a sport and a beauty and um, uh, an amazing, um, you know, animals who compete at the highest levels is always something that, that, you know, to me personally, I was interested in. Obviously, at USADA, we don't currently aren't involved with the day-to-day -day equine um, world necessarily, although on our equestrian side, we, we do have some interaction with it. Um, but, you know, che cheating and um, honesty and ethics and the rule of sport are the same across all sports. So while some might want to say there's a difference between equine um, anti-doping and medication control programs and what happens in humans, you know, the, the mentality of cheating and trying to get away and get an advantage against the rules is, is all the same. So we're really looking forward and it's a, obviously a huge um, responsibility, um, but one that we're fully ready to embrace to, to, to learn the nuts and bolts of the industry that we don't know and put in a gold standard program that people in the industry can have a lot of satisfaction and pride that it's being done at the, at the highest levels with, um, you know, of an equal opportunity to win playing by the rules, which is all any athlete, whether you're a trainer owner of a horse or a human athlete, that's all you can ask for. Travis, it's Bill Finley, and thanks for joining us. And it's probably going to be a two-part question. So, John, if you bear with me uh, for just a second. So, obviously, you're brought in because people believe that USADA will do a better job policing the sport than the current setup with horse racing commissions. So, Take that and run with it. Why will USADA, in your opinion, be better than the current system that we have? Yeah, listen, I, I and and I hate the sort of who's better, who's worse. But but look, the reality is, and and my we first saw this, you know, close up uh, reference the 2012 Jockey Club roundtable that that I was invited to speak at, and and really started looking at the policies around anti doping and medication control within the industries, and and like they were just they were completely antiquated. They were years behind what the human world, as well as the equine and thoroughbred horse racing industry around the world, ha had done as far as uniform policy. So not 38 different racing districts run by state, you know, frequently conflicted people that had an interest in the outcome without transparency, without good quality testing without laboratory accreditation that was uniform. And so it was a myriad of different rules and regulations. It, it actually reminded me, and I drew the comparison to what the Olympic world looked like prior to us coming into existence here in the United States in, in two, October of 2000. We just had our 20 year anniversary. So the, the fact that it's going to be uniform and that you can have confidence that when a horse runs in California, it's going to be, you know, running under the same um, rules and allowances and free of drugs in Kentucky and in New York. You know, the, the idea that this sport is not across state lines anymore is just, you know, it's kind of silly, frankly. And so having that uniform policy is going to be a game changer, I think, right out of the gate, regardless of, of who's running it. But, but then you look at the program and the expertise that we're going to bring from not, not just a testing standpoint. And I think what's really important as we begin the education of, with the industry on this and always get the question, well, how's the testing going to be different? The, the, just to look at testing is, again, an antiquated old way of looking at modern anti-doping and how you professionalize and ensure that the athletes' rights and their health and safety are going to be protected. It has to start with education. And that's going to be uniform education about the rules across the country. It's going to have to have research involved to ensure 
that things that might not be tested for today in a you know robust way can be tested for and any new drugs that are coming out that would tempt trainers or owners to give their horses for example are going to also be able to be detected but but then you also have to have a results management process because we know the science is limited i mean it's limited by the money that goes into it the innovation that can be created. And it's a complex matrix looking at some of these drugs, some that are endogenous or natural to a human body or a horse body. Um, so distinguishing what's synthetic versus what's endogenous is sometimes a, a difficult thing. And, and you have to get that right from a scientific standpoint. But that means you have to also have an investigative and an intelligence gathering model. And we have a whistleblower line. And look, we, we're the first to say it takes a team to be successful. So, so make the call. Last year in our human world, we had close to 500 tips to our um, whistleblower line. And we have a robust internal process where we investigate each and every one of those. And, and quite honestly, when we direct tests off of that information, we have a, a close to 22% positivity return, clearly indicating that when handled, when the information comes in, it's handled appropriately, it leads to the detection. And that ultimately feeds what we're ultimately after, which is the deterrence. We don't want people to cheat, but if it's too easy to get away with and there's no consequence if you get caught, then people will take advantage of that. And that's what we have to stop. And I think plugging those holes and putting in that type of program is, I think, going to do wonders to, to, to really in, in ensure that people actually play by the rules and aren't trying to take the risk. But also knowing if you take the risk and you try to cheat, you're going to get caught and you're going to get a sanction. And that's the way the rules should work, to protect those who are playing by the rules. Thanks, Travis. And now for my follow-up question. About one year ago at this time, we saw the single most significant development in the history of horse racing when it comes to catching the bad guys, which was the indictments against the 27 people, including some very prominent trainers. And what we learned from that was that the FBI didn't just rely on drug testing. They relied on old-fashioned FBI police work, including wiretaps and things like that. Uh, and that's something racing commissions don't have, the best of my knowledge, don't have the ability or the legal right to do. Can you guys go above and beyond drug testing and use such things as wiretapping people's phones to try to catch some people? Yeah, I mean, it, as I just mentioned about our whistleblower line, I mean, we're a, we're a private organization, so we're not a government law enforcement. That said, we work very, very closely with law enforcement. In fact, that very case that you referenced that started with a tip that we got in an investigation we did into a cyclist who was actually obtaining, he tested positive. He was obtaining his drugs from one of the distributors that was ultimately indicted. And that was information that we developed and handed to the FBI to say, look, we don't have jurisdiction over horse racing, but the evidence we obtained in our investigation of this cyclist who tested positive and got a sanction clearly reveals that the drugs are also being given to trainers and eat in thoroughbred horse racing. And so we sort of pack it, we call it the Tiffany's box. We package it up and do what we can do within the bounds of our authority and our law, package it up. And then with our wonderful working relationships with, you know, FBI across the country, um, border uh, control, HSI, you know, bringing things in and out of the country, um, other DEA, other law enforcement, FDA, other law enforcement agencies, where these are crimes that we don't police or have jurisdiction over because we deal with sport rules and sport violations, but we're going to work very closely where it's appropriate and, and the evidence suggests that it should be and, and hand them that Tiffany's box and, and be the advocates for the victims, those who are getting robbed in sport to say, hey, you've got to go after and enforce the laws. you you got to remember sometimes, unfortunately, you know, the type of corruption and um, fraud you saw in that case obviously rose to a high level, but but some of it is so, you know, while it has a major impact on sport, the federal government is not interested because they have a priority list that is terrorism and, you know, all the other things that they investigate and enforce that are bigger priorities than, you know, if a trainer gave a horse, you know, a, a, a drug. And so, having that partnership of a private organization whose job it is to protect the playing field from a private sport rule enforcement standpoint, but being able to be the to win drug, when, you know, federal or other state laws have been violated to 
advocate for the enforcement of those laws. It's a, it's a wonderful two, uh, two-pronged approach partnership that, that works extremely well. And Travis, you know, it's a breath of fresh air hearing everything you're saying. And I know that we were so excited, you know, the three of us on the podcast, but also all of us who are in the industry, were so enthusiastic and excited to see you come in um, and try to clean up the industry and the sport that we love. You know, the industry, we're in this because we it's for love of the animal, love of the sport, love of the competition. Um, and to be on an even playing field now with um, you know, the, all the trainers have a chance, all the owners have a chance, and now it's based on your skill level and not your, your ability to be a chemist. So thank you for, for taking this on. Um, my, my first question to you is, does your jurisdiction strictly in racing or does it also, uh, does the umbrella also cover the breeding industry and the sales industries as well? Yeah, so, well, thanks for the kind words. And, and look, it, it's, a, it's a huge responsibility. We're, we're honored to be part of it. We feel like it's a tremendous privilege. We, we recognize that we're going to have to work every day and every night to prove that we're the right organization for this. You know, we're, we're here to, and, and look, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a risk to us as well, but, but we're willing to embrace that risk because we think it does create opportunities for greatness where the rules matter and you can win by playing by the rules. And that's what we're really passionate about. And so thank you for those comments. And, and I hope, and we're in and trust, I promise you, we're going to work hard to, to fulfill that hope that, that you have and, and recognize what a tremendous, you know, responsibility that, it, that it is. Um, you know, listen, I, I think, it, I think our, um, our, our willingness to, you know, dive in and roll our sleeves up is going to be what makes the difference. Um, and, I, and I would hope that, you know, people in the industry, you know, rise to the opportunity to be able to play, um, you know, play by the rules and, and want to win the right way is what we're after. And, and hopefully, as I mentioned earlier about the deterrence effect that, you know, I think necessarily you're going to see detection at some level. But the hope is, hey, there, the rules have changed and the enforcement has changed. And so our, our, to be, you know, answer your specific question, our jurisdiction under the law, and, and this will have to be ultimately, you know, by contract, you know, defined with um, the authority and us, because I think as you probably know, under the law, it creates an, an authority, which we, we don't have anything to do with. It's an independent group of people. Their jurisdiction is both anti-doping and medication control as well as racetrack safety. And so our role is on anti-doping and medication control. And it does cover, you know, covered horses as well as covered people, which would include breeders and trainers. So if we see or have evidence of whether a positive test or other information of an owner who is covered, doping a horse for purposes of selling it at, you know, a, a, an auction, even if they're done racing, um, you know, until that horse is retired, then, then yeah, that's a violation that, that ultimately would be enforced. Well, I wanted to ask about, about the, the moral side of, of trying to bust cheaters and, and dopers, you know, with the Lance Armstrong thing, I think that that, that resonated with so many people because he was, he was a hero to a lot of people. He was, he was an icon and to, to expose that kind of cheating, I think, you know, I, I, I think it showed everybody kind of the, the, the seedy immoral side of sports in racing, I, I feel like it's even more important to bust these guys because horses die. Horses break down and die because of drugs. Can you speak to that and speak to what kind of motivation you guys have on the, the to not just, you know, on the on the legality question, but on the morality question of how yeah. important that is to clean up the sport? Yeah, well, well I, you know, listen, I, I, I just think it's wrong to cheat and steal from someone else, right? Like that, that, that used to be a principle, <laughs> whether there was a law about it or not, that used to be a principle our country and our citizens embrace pretty freely. We, we seem to have thrown some of that out the window. And, and look, I, what I do appreciate, because I've sat down with, you know, a Lance Armstrong, a Tyler Hamilton, a Marion Jones, and, I, and I've heard the pressures that are on those athletes to, to win. And I hear the hyper competitive environment and the win at all cost mentality. And so it, there is a culture in our society, and we should be honest about it, that, that it's OK to win, even if you cheat, as long as you don't get caught. And I think a lot of people approach life in that way. And that is from our standpoint is simply wrong. 
However, in sport, the rules are very clear. And so we can land just on the rules. And our justification is the rules say you can't do that. If, if, if society wants to change the rules and say it's a free for all and you can dope and cheat and do whatever you can to win and nobody cares about it, then, then, then that's okay. I mean, I don't like it, but we'll go find new jobs and, and, and life will go on. But as long as society has said, no, rules matter, and as long as sport has, has said rules matter, then we ought to enforce those rules to ensure that they fulfill the promise that they give to people who are abiding by the rules. What's the worst case is you're abiding by the rules with the good faith understanding that everyone else is also abiding by the rules, but you end up losing, getting robbed, getting cheated, because the people who also have agreed to the rules are secretly breaking the rules behind your back to get a, an advantage. And that's where our frustration comes in for the victims of this, which are the athletes. And look, I think in horse racing, as you, as you pointed out, is it's even that much more important because the horses don't have a choice. They, they can't say no. You know, we, we saw Russia state sponsored doping where look, those athletes, they, they didn't have much of a choice. They were soldiers of the state. And they were told to go out and dope and go win. And that's what they did. In the Lance Armstrong cycling generation, look, a lot of the clean athletes got kicked out of the sport. And they really didn't have a choice. You either cheat and, and get a contract or you lose. And if you lose, you're not getting a contract. So they literally were kicked out of the sport. But in horse race, so, so to some extent, they still had a choice. But in horse racing, the, 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 the athletes don't have a choice. They're at the whims of, you know, a trainer or an owner. And, and that's even an, a, a more unfair situation if you look at it from, you know, a, a free choice to abide by the rule or not abide by the rule. Travis, if you think about the history of what you're talking about, I would imagine they were cheating in the first ever Olympics thousands of years ago. And the incentive to cheat is built into society, especially when there's a lot of money on the line. I mean, the horse Maximum Security, which is the most famous horse trained by Jason Service, who was one of the ones that was uh, involved in the indictments, was running in million dollar horse races. So keeping that in mind, what is what is the goal? What is practical? Can you actually wipe out all cheating or can you just do the best possible job that you can hand? You can possibly do knowing that at the end of the day, there's despite you saw it, despite everything else, there's still going to be some people who are going to try to take an edge. Yeah, I, listen, I, we, 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 it's a great question. We have no choice but to fight as if we're going to win it. And, and one athlete who gets robbed by another who intentionally breaks the rules and gains a material advantage by using these drugs to beat them it is an injustice we can't stand by and, and watch or be comfortable with. We, we have to stop that. And that's what motivates us every day to fight as hard as we do to protect the, the victim the person that gets robbed to protect their right. I, I think what we saw in cycling today in cycling, athletes have have hope and they can win. Where a generation ago, 10 years ago, um, the, the 15 years ago during the height of the, the Postal Service's victories, look, I don't, I don't think you could have won even a single stage if you weren't part of the, the corrupt doping culture. Um, so I think significant victories and change of culture, the bias should be in favor of those playing by the rules. And you should have a fair opportunity to win without breaking the rules. And that's what we strive for each and every day. So, so Travis, what can we do? What can you know, this podcast do? What can we do as owners and breeders in the industry to try to make it a more you know, even playing field and to try to help USADA? Um, you know, make it so it is a fair industry and a fair game. Yeah, listen, I, you know, the obviously the input on, and, and let me be really clear, this, this is not going to be successful. I mean, I said it earlier, it literally takes a team. It's not going to be successful if it's just, you know, a top down, here are the rules and, you know, we're going to hammer anybody that crosses the, the line. It, it has to be a, a community of people who say, you know what, this is important and this is right. And we're going to, you know, embrace this by giving input on what the rules should be by being willing to, as I mentioned earlier, pick up the phone and call us, you know, the 500 tips on our human Olympic side last year, um, but also supporting the clean sport and abiding by those rules and saying, hey, it's not acceptable anymore to do X, Y, and Z 
because they're, it's clearly in violation of the rules. And, and really embracing that, it, it has to be an organic community-led um, you know, deterrent and uh, program that, uh, that allows for a clean sport to thrive. It, it can't, it, it's not going to be us alone that does it. Um, And and we recognize that. And that's why, you know, in part with our cycling investigation, our Nike Oregon um, project investigation that recently has come down, we've worked extremely hard to build relationships and have the trust of the community. You know, the worst thing is if you're actually trying to abide by the rules is that you don't believe that the people who are supposed to be enforcing the rules actually are enforcing it in a fair way, that they have your back, so to speak. And so we work really hard to gain that confidence and gain that trust, um, but but we simply can't do it alone. So any support, um, you know, within the trenches and within the industry, picking up the phone when you see something that might be questionable, letting our review process work its way through, um, th- those are the types of things that are going to need to happen um, to make it uh, successful. And, and listen, that didn't happen right out of the gate when we came into the Olympic world. It, it took several years for people to gain that trust. And, and now, you know, the 500 calls to our tip line, I think is a great example where people are, people are picking up the phone and calling because they want their right to clean competition to be enforced and upheld. And, and what information would you need from somebody when they're calling in a, a tip? It can't just be, hey, I, I, I saw this trainer and his horse, you know, one by 20 lengths. He's obviously doping. What, what yeah. tangible information do you need? Yeah, well, listen, I, you know, the certainly performance data is part of our analysis, too. And, you know, I've mentioned sometimes the Justin Gatlin case, for example. Justin Gatlin, one of the best sprinters in the world back in, I think it was 07, um, set a world record in the 100 meter dash in May of that. Yeah, it may have been 06, May of that year. And, you know, our team monitors that type of performance because anybody that knows sprinting, knows you don't you don't peak in May and set a world record. You wait until the Olympic Games or the World Championships, which are in August of that year. And so that kind of information will be information that we closely follow because it is important information um, from a testing standpoint. And if we're going to target test or in our out of competition testing, that type of common sense things like, wow, that doesn't happen unless something really unusual happen. So we don't throw out our common sense, but, but it can be anything quite honestly. And, and I would, I would say if you have a, if you have a question, just call and I'd rather it waste our time vetting it and it not turn out to be anything versus not making the call. And it ends up turning into something later that is really, you know, detrimental and could have been stopped years earlier or never gets stopped to begin with. So I always do, I always tell people just defer and call, pick up the phone and call. And and look, we have, and it's incumbent upon us, as we know in our Olympic world, and it'll be the same in the equine world is to have a robust internal process that, you know, it's not somebody calling because they're a sore loser and they got beat. Right. And, And then us doing something based on that. We, we have professional investigators, you know, former, police officers, DEA agents, federal law enforcement that vet that, lawyers that are well-versed in these issues. And, and we, we, we take appropriate action based on the type of information that, that comes in. John's a pretty sore loser, so I can't guarantee that he won't call you up complaining. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but, but we, we've a, seen it, you know, we've seen it. Well, and look, you know, nobody likes to, to lose, right? Like we're all very, very competitive as sports should be, but what we hate more than anything is losing to someone that cheats us. Of course. Of course. Yeah, no. So this is, this is my last question. You've been very generous with your time. Um, you must've faced, I assume you've faced a lot of institutional pushback from the sport of cycling when, you know, you're trying to take down it, it, its biggest star. I think the situation is a little different in racing, largely because of the indictments last year. I think there are a lot of people in racing who are open to this kind of change and this kind of enforcement. You mentioned that you've had some conversation with some horse people. What is the vibe that you've gotten from them in terms of welcoming you and USADA to come get involved? Yeah, yeah. Well, one thing, you know, the, the, and I, I understand how sometimes it gets characterized as trying to take down someone that's not how we look at, right? Like we, we want to exonerate and we work just as hard to exonerate the innocent as we do to hold those who have broken the rules accountable. And so while I understand the, the 
um, you know, we held Lance Armstrong accountable and we would have been just as satisfied, if not more, if we would have proven that he did it the right way. The yeah, no, I wasn't suggesting that you had like um, a vendor. Yeah, right? but, but just to be, just so people understand, I mean, our, that's not our, that's not our, that's not how we approach this intellectually. We approach it literally as, you know, exonerating the innocent or holding those accountable who broke the rules, whose decision themselves um, made them break the rules and they should be held accountable. You, you know, listen, I, I think the industry, uh, as I said earlier, we, we were invited we were then invited by um, the Hill based on some industry people talking to the Hill. We've had a lot of interaction over the last eight plus years with wonderful people in the industry, um, you know, trainers, owners, breeders, all sides of it, who have asked really tough questions and really good questions, who have embraced the effort. I think it's been, you know, their constant effort, the obvious deaths out in uh, California, and then the indictments that I think created this perfect storm that finally got you know loosened some of the entrenched positions and said we're gonna we're gonna do this and so we're I, th- I think we feel um, very good that the industry wants this to happen for the lar- for the most part there will obviously be those who like the status quo because it's been very profitable for them but. You know they're they're eventually going to either be weeded out or to change their behavior, and and they'll be given a, a fair opportunity. I mentioned education earlier, but the education is is key to you know not sending lambs to the slaughter. The, the rules will change, and the enforcement's going to change. But you'll be given adequate time to to change behavior in order to comply with those new rules and 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 improve that you can win the right way. Listen, Travis, I got to say this: everything you're saying right now is music to our ears, and this Good. is something. It's something like, you know, we, we do this podcast every week and we talk about these issues. We talk about drugs. We talk about poor safety. And it just sometimes feels like, you know, hitting your head against the wall because nothing, you know, nothing changes. And you rarely ever get the ear of someone who's in a position to make something change. So we can't thank you enough for coming on. And hey I, guys, thanks for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Now, listen, I mean, it, it you know, it's those are our goals. It's going to take a lot of hard work and obviously the, the funding, but we're, we're ready to, we're ready to go and we're going to, we're going to bust it to, to get there and, and hopefully fulfill the, the, the hopes and, and promise that we're making. Um, and yeah. We're- and, and, and we, we certainly appreciate it. And we would love, you know, down the line somewhere to, to have you back on and talk about the progress. Yeah, you bet. Time. No, for sure. As this continues to develop, let's for sure do that. We'll be, you know, a whole nother layer of sort of the rules and the procedures and, you know, the test distribution plan, the lab accreditation, all that sort of stuff that that I think hopefully people will find interesting, but also see and be able to really contrast the the before and after um, and see what a difference. Uh, Absolutely. Going to make. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what we're hoping right, guys. for. So, yeah, thank we you, appreciate Travis. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, Travis. Thank you. Travis. Thank you. Thank you. All right, y'all take Go care. Thank Get you. Right. Yeah, please. Get them. <laughs>